Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. What is up, folks? Yep. <laughs> Your shock jock is here, Rich Redman. It's time for the Rich Redman Show where we talk about all things music, motivation, success. We love these things. These things drive us. They inspire us. It's a reason to live. Really excited about today's guest, originally hailing from Saratoga, New York, calling Music City home for eight plus years. Today's guest is a fantastic all-around drummer who's worked with top acts in New York City, Vegas, and Nashville, some of which include Mannheim Steamroller, a Miles Davis tribute show that he leads, it's his own band, and Tracy Lawrence, where we got to spend some time together. Today, I'm talking about our friend Brian Zach. What's up, bud? Hey, how's it going? Boom, boom, boom. Great now, how's that for a Hollywood intro? It was fantastic. <laughs> I, I love it. I, I need to have you with me everywhere I go. I, You know what? It's... <laughs> You know, and I would do it, and of course, I'd be wearing some sort of like portable timpani, so I can just do like. Yeah. There you go. There yeah, you go. man. Show biz, baby. So <laughs> this is great. You know, I remember um, running into you, or we. When was it? We connected in Vegas. Was it over yeah. a decade ago? Uh, yeah, it would have been. Um, a, a, an old friend of mine put me in touch with your well he called me one day and he said that you were in town and he gave me your number. Apparently he had known you, Danny young. Do you remember Danny? Oh yeah. Young? Danny. Yeah. Danny. Yeah. Danny ended up making the, um, all those products, the, the bald man, stuff. the bald man stuff. Yeah. Yes. And so he told me you were in town for a day or two or whatever it was and gave me your number. And I just on a whim was like, okay, I'll give him a call. And see what happened. I had no idea what to expect. Yeah, we hung, man. And and yeah, you you answered and you said, "Come pick me up tomorrow morning, and we'll hang, and I'll give you a lesson and all this stuff." So we did. I I picked you up at the MGM. We yeah. drove over. I had this at the time. I had this lockout studio where I kept my drums. Yep. We went in there, and it was so funny. I remember it really like it was yesterday because. We got in there and you asked me to start playing. And so I, I don't know, I was playing. I don't even think I was playing to music. I was just grooving on something. And I went straight through my snare drum head. You're like, yes, which I I never do that. Like that never happens to me. You know, breaking a snare head is like a really uncommon occurrence in my world. I don't know. Yeah. I, I hit hard, but I just don't break heads. I don't know what it is. No, I but, pit them. I, I don't. I don't break them. Back in the day, yeah. when I was using ambassadors, geez, but I, I haven't right. seen. I haven't seen an ambassador in years. It was just the most bizarre thing, and I remember just being shocked. And I looked up at you, and you're just laughing like hysterically, and it, we just bonded. Like that was just a moment of like, yeah. oh yes, like drummers. Just you know, this happens. To, well, to all I don't. Life. I don't know what the heck I would have showed you because you're such a great player. But maybe it. Maybe it. Planted a little bit of germ in the back of your mind, like, hey, man, Music City. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we did a lot of mostly talking. We talked about career stuff and, yeah. you know, your trajectory and, and how to go about that kind of thing. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I you know, I, I guess probably it might have planted a seed. I mean, there were, there were various moments in my Vegas years where I thought, hmm, wow, those guys in Nashville are really playing their butts off, you know? And I'd have to play the, I was playing in like a country covers band and I'd have to learn these songs. And, yeah. you know, and I mean, I hadn't typically listened to any of this stuff before. So it was all new to me learning this music. And I loved it, you know? I mean, it, all the Aldine, all the Rascal Flats, and gosh, I mean, there was just so much, you know, uh, Dirks Bentley and, yeah. you know, and I just remember hearing this music and, and, like remarking to myself, wow, like this is real, like these are real musicians playing in a real studio still, you know, because so much of the stuff you play in Vegas is all the Lady Gaga and like the the sort of copy and paste, you know, tracks. And there's yeah. not really any humans on a lot of that stuff. And I just love human playing, you know. Yeah, so yeah. it really spoke to me even back well, then. Well, I'm glad you ended up here and and I and I know another situation that kind of 
planted a seed i mean let's face it this truly i mean there is music happening in a lot of metropolitan areas but this is just seems to be a very robust city and everyone is coming and we still for the most part get together in the same room and do stuff now you're yeah. if if you guys aren't watching this you're just listening brian is in this killer he's got his man cave above the garage that he's converted into a beautiful studio i'm in my man cave above my garage that i've converted into a studio and it's just kind of like a way of life and now as traffic is getting a little bit worse and we're becoming a real real city uh we are sending files to each other you know and it's more affordable and it cuts down on the the travel time and all that kind of stuff so your your room looks fantastic now you're here eight years but let's go back um you studied with Gordon Stout at Ithaca, am I correct? That's right. I did. So <laughs> the funny thing about Gordon is, uh, now I studied with Alan Shin, who was a all-around percussionist, and then when I went to North Texas State, of course, Dr. Troma, Ron Fink, all-around percussionist, and then, of course, the great Ed Sof, Henry Oxtell, mostly drum set players. But the thing about Gordon, Gordon is a world-renowned virtuosic marimbist. Yes. And... I can totally really relate to your story because I studied classical percussion and I did all my Kaiko Abi and my yellow after the rain and all the, <laughs> I probably played all sorts of stout pieces and, right. um, but I was a drum set player. Yeah. You know what I mean, at the same. heart of it. Totally the same. Yeah. Right. And always knew there, there would make no mistake. There was, I always knew I'm a drum set player playing the marimba and you know, I didn't have a natural ability on that instrument. Like I did with a drum set. Did you, you have know. piano training growing up? Uh, a little in high school, yeah. That always helps. That always helps. And I used to play, like my father played piano, and so there was a piano in the house all the time, and I would just kind of figure out songs by ear and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, but, yeah, Gordon, I mean, I don't think I ever heard Gordon play a wrong note ever in the four years that I studied at Ithaca. And like, it's easy to do on a four mallet marimba piece because oh, man. you can I mean, just I've, graze that yeah. note the wrong way. Yeah. Yeah, he's he is just amazing, and his re I mean, he could you could put anything in front of him, he would just read it like like it's nothing, you know, yeah. just like he's reading the newspaper at the breakfast, you know. It's just like, yeah, he was. It's interesting good. though, all the work that goes into to mastering, say, like you're Lee Howard Stevens or you're Gordon Stout or you're Kaiko Abi, or, and there's a new generation of these stellar marimbists that are that are forming you know as we speak um there's two things you do you teach yeah. you write books and then you have to go out and appear as a soloist yeah with orchestras and chambers and it, it what a grind i mean that is a tough life yeah i guess so i mean un unless you start landing those those gigs of the, you know playing concertos and stuff with the with the symphonic orchestras i mean that sounds like that could be a cool gig um yeah you know, but yeah, that's a tough world to, to break into, I bet. But know? obviously he was like, I know what you're going to do. Let's let's teach you musicianship on this instrument because there's so much you can learn from it as far as like yes. the touch and tone yes. production. And you Phrasing. can't. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All that. Yeah. I mean, much of our lessons were about phrasing and just motion. And like if you had, a, for instance, if you had a, a repeating note of any kind, it would never be played like static unless it was meant to be static but uh, but otherwise you you know you you're going somewhere with that note it's crescendoing <laughs> or stay crescendoing it's it's moving to some place yeah. and so i would take those lessons on the marimba with gordon and take them to my drum set in the practice room to the drum set and apply all of that musicianship to the drum set you know and think of I mean, just the idea of like sit down at the drum set and think of the drum set as a marimba as a as a melodic instrument like you know we're getting into some heavy concepts already here <laughs> you know no, it's, so, it's good it, it, it like, is a weapon in the wrong hands the drum set <laughs> it really is for sure, for sure and yeah just it's all just all about thinking in a musical way you know how do i play in a musical way where people aren't just holding their ears like will you stop playing the blast beats <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> that's that that is the one style that i just do not do uh you know i'm, I'm, I'm sure yeah. you're familiar but the thing is is that now if folks aren't familiar with you and i will say that go to your website it's a great uh, very robust website 
the spelling of your last name, Zach, C-Z-A-C-H. What, what nationality is that? What are the roots? That is Polish, and my father was 100% Polish, so nice. I'm half. Uh-huh. Yeah, Did you do uh, the pierogies yeah. at the holidays and all that oh, stuff? Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, but, kielbasas and pierogies, and I mean... I always love the potatoes. The potato... <laughs> oh, man, potatoes and onions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah. I know where I'm coming for the holidays. Um, so anyways, <laughs> if people go to your website, they can see you are you are an all around drum set artist. So there's no style really that you haven't covered because when you were doing you've done cruise ships, we'll get into that. You've done tons of tribute shows, the Carol Kings, the Bee Gees, the t- t- and where you have to be a reader, you do big band reading, you lead small groups. I, I see videos of you doing jazz brunches. You do uh, multi-genre recording sessions and then then you were on the road with us doing Tracy Lawrence so you're like you know uh, bringing the drum parts of like Eddie Bears and Lonnie Wilson to, so you do everything and that's what I love about your playing is that you are an all around stylist musician and that's why you having lived in New York and Vegas perfect city Perfect yeah. city for you to be in. Tell us about what happened after college. Well, after college, you know, you graduate with this performance degree and then you go, well, what now? <laughs> you know, and it's, not, you know, Ithaca isn't exactly a, a, a music industry mecca. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of creativity there and there's a lot of cool stuff happening in the arts world. But to make money is nearly impossible. Um, and I sort of bummed around Ithaca for uh almost a year um until a friend of mine called me up one day and he said he was going down to new york city to audition for this cruise ship agency and he was like do you want to come and i I didn't even have to think about it i was like yeah i just i mean i was just interested in a free trip to new york city i didn't i wasn't really interested in working on the ship at all i'm so curious as to what this audition was because i sometimes I have heard about guys doing auditions over the phone where the, the contractor's like, oh, yeah. play me a boss up, play me a samba, play yeah. me a two beat, play me a, a two four swing, play me I your did rock one beat. Of those once, but it wasn't a cruise ship. It was some other audition. I did that over the phone once. Yeah, that was really awkward. Hilarious. But no, I so I went down to New York and I auditioned. And the moment the audition was done, they were like, great, when can you leave? <laughs> and I was like, I didn't have a passport. Like I had, I, you know, I had to break my lease for my apartment at the time. Like but I you had did nothing it. in order. You nothing. Did it. Yeah. But it was like, okay, give me a month to get all these things in order and I'll do it. And that was it. And a month later I was out on the high seas. <laughs> okay. So now I I'm jealous because you're, you're a young man. You're probably what? 22, 23, 24 years old, something like that. Right. Yep, and I was asked to do so many cruise ship gigs and I always managed to stay on. I never did. I never went and did it. I was like, Oh my God, seeing all these Caribbean and, and European beautiful places. And I'm sure just like you're single and then just the women and the, the nightlife and ah, it had to be fun, man. It was fun. It was good fun for a good while. I mean, a lot of it did depend on the band that you were in, who was in the band, you know, who you made friends with, sort of your circle of friends. I mean, the status of the band, because there's there's featured acts yeah. that get treated a little bit better. Right. Yeah. And yeah. Even like the company that you were working for, it, you know, it, it varied pretty greatly. Um, at the time I was with Holland America. And so we were treated quite well I, I i have to say in hindsight um the ship i was on was an older ship so the rooms the cabins were big and we had a couch and everything in the room like that you know that Holy was cow. On the yeah. up with the newer ships and um you know we could we could walk anywhere in the passenger areas as long as you were in the correct uniform and uh you know go to the bars drink and you know meet the passengers yeah i mean it was very you know I, the food we could we could eat in the dining areas so we didn't have to eat like in the crew mess area at all because there is a in the bowels of the ship yeah yeah i mean the 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 quality of in food is quite different between the isn't that crazy like "Ah, there is a crew guy give him the swill yeah i know yeah and if you're out there for like you know i mean i was doing four month contracts i mean that'll get old really quick you know but you could get off right and explore like hey let's go get some conch fritters and come on yeah we we had a lot of time off even on a work day we 
probably would work about three or four hours a day if that, you know, on some days. I mean, so you could get off and go see whatever port you were in and, you know, kind of, I mean, you, you know, you're in this sort of seven day pattern. So you start to learn what's where and what island and where the good beaches are versus the bad beaches and nice. all, you know, all that stuff. And you start to figure all those things out. And uh, yeah, it was a great time. I mean, the nightlife was fun. You know, like you said, I mean, you're a single guy and you're just, you know, out there just yucking it up with a bunch of other single guys, you know. Now, didn't you eventually meet your bride on the ship? Eventually, yes. Um, it was the, yeah, the the last contract that both my wife and I did. We met and um, started dating and uh, just kind of by coincidence, we both had the same sign-off date of that contract. Wow. And I told her, I said, you know, I'm moving to New York City. That was the plan. And I don't know what your plan is, but it would be great if, you know, you could come to New York also. How and cute. So she made it work out. Yeah. yeah. So she about I don't know, a few months later, she made it to New York. She got a visitor's visa because she's from the Philippines originally. Now, what was she doing? Was she a dancer? Or? She was working at the front desk as a receptionist kind nice. of that that job. Um and we wouldn't have met except that she was the director of the Filipino crew show, which my band had to play rhythm section for. So like once every two weeks or something like that, we had to play this show and she was a director and um, we would play the show. And then after the show, there'd be a, a big party in the, in the crew area for everyone in the show and that yeah. was where we we met and started mingling so yeah. mix the, the mix and mingle now uh i usually will listen to one other podcast to pre prep for my interviews and now where was this you did a gig i'm thinking where you ended up playing the entire stage and you're playing stands and monitors and oh tables and floors and yes oh gosh we're going back well uh, you're the guy you were the guy you were like it's a it's a krupa thing let's start on the floor tom and then work our way around the room yeah right? it was literally the sing 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 song and the bit in the show was for the drummer to come up like stand up like come around the drums all while playing the stands and the cymbals and whatever you could reach and then eventually make your way down all the way to the front edge of the stage and put on a show with the drumsticks and like nothing else there's nothing I mean, there were two monitors just like two wedge monitors down there and that was all i had to work with and so i started getting into like figuring out little tricks that i could do with the sticks and just try to put on a show of some kind because honestly i mean i was so out of my element especially the first like couple times doing it because you know the drum set is your safety net you know, yeah. it's like your safety. You you feel like you're invincible back there behind all these drums and cymbals. The moment you leave the drums, you know, especially for this 25 year old or whatever I was at the time, you know, it's like, what do I do with my hands? What, how do I stand? How do, you know, like, oh, my gosh, people are looking at my legs. <laughs> you know, like, right. what pants do I wear? You know, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's it's a very uncomfortable feeling when you're not used to that and um so yeah. it, so you benefited because it brought you out of your shell just a little bit and you had to learn about yeah i guess so i mean i was yeah and the, the the singer that i was working with i mean he was he was he's a he's a trained actor and you know he would be on uh i think he was in west end shows and stuff like that in london mm. and so he would help me just with like blocking and just always sort of give me helpful hints about do this, do that, don't do that kind of thing, you know, smile, make sure you smile. And uh, even if inside you're like all torn up, you know, smile. Like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it goes a long way, you know, what a, what a cool thing, man. Yeah, it, it was. And I did that for a long time, man, because he was a headliner act on the cruise ships. I, tra I would travel with him over 10 years. I, I did that gig with him. Wow, you know, off and on the different ships, and we would go to Europe. I mean, we we would do the Mediterranean every summer, and I saw a lot of cool places playing that show. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, you still have the bug to continue to travel internationally here and there, or are you just like I I'm cool? I saw the world. I mean, I quite a bit. I'm cool, you know, because I have seen a lot of stuff. Although, funny you mention that. This morning, I got a call to play a couple of shows 
in Japan. Ah, here. So I'm I am excited about that because I haven't been to Japan in gosh maybe almost almost twenty years. I've so. seen everything but Tokyo. Got to oh, go man. to Tokyo. Got, it's like it is so wild there. It's like I I mean it's it's fascinating and there's really nothing like it that I've experienced because you know you can't really read the language <laughs> um, unless there's something translated. It's almost like being like on the moon or like on an alien planet or something because you know you're walking down the street you, you can't read any of the street signs you don't know what anything is that a hardware store or is that a restaurant I I don't know you know it's it's wild yeah you know? it's great, there's such though. a incredibly unique people you know what I mean oh, and yeah and but but and especially there's so they're so great with musicians and artists. I mean, they're so attentive. They're, so, they're some of the best audiences I've ever performed for ever. And a lot of respect there for the arts. Oh, I mean, I mean, we were, I played the blue note in Tokyo and like, wow, you could hear a pin drop in that room, man. They're like, listening. So, they're listening. They're there to, to listen and meet you afterward and show you respect. And I mean, it's, it's wild. It's very different. Yeah. Very cool. That is so, so cool, buddy. Incredible. Yeah. This is, this is my, fourth year of getting this card this is my i'm a card carrying sag aftra so the idea of like being away from the drums i it was always a thing like can i do something in life that is creative where i am not buried behind all this wood and plastic and metal and i right. just pushed myself to do it and i have a natural affinity for it but i could totally relate to that where it's like that is our comfort zone back there and it's good to oh, yeah. occasionally you know, yeah. get up and play a tambourine and sing a background vocal or jump on some conga drums and you know what I mean? Like get out yeah. from that thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Um, sometimes I have like guitar or bass player envy because those guys can walk around the They're stage. They're mobile. Yeah. Strut and move their, you know, put one leg up and, you know, <laughs> I, you know, but you're back there like I can't move, you know. Dude, I, I would be dangerous if I played the bass. I would I, I would work that real. crowd like it would be it would, it would be criminal. So, tell us what borough were you in in New York? Any funny stories? Uh how, I live so I live in Queens. Nice. Uh, I first started out in Kew Gardens, which is like way out there. And then eventually my wife and I, we moved to Woodside and we re rode the seven train. I'm a huge New York Mets fan. So ah. we would go see the New York Mets at Shea Stadium anytime that we could. We didn't have a lot of money at the time. So it was, you know, it was a big deal if we were going to the game. But um, get that pretzel and hot dog. Oh, man. I mean, yeah, I, I love baseball. So that I mean, that was that wasn't why I moved to Queens. It, it just happened to be an apartment. A friend of mine had a, a, you know, a bedroom open up in an apartment and that was where I ended up, you know, but um, yeah, it was great. I mean, New York, New York will humble you, man. <laughs> like, well, yeah. The know, city that never hard. sleeps and it's just, yeah. It, everything like that's mundane about your life is way more difficult there. Like doing laundry or just parking your car. It's a know. thing. Like oh. grocery shopping yeah. is a thing. Yes. Parking yeah. is a thing. Yeah. And, and I feel like that in Los Angeles. It's like just like there's so many people there in these little boxes and the sun's beaming down on them. But just just to get into the Vaughn's parking lot and find a space it, and just yeah. creeping along, you know, Sunset Boulevard, bumper to bumper. It's a thing, man. Yes, for real. Yeah. Yeah. It'll make you grow old faster, I think. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, um, I loved it, you know, but eventually, you know, when you turn 30 years old and you start looking at life a little bit differently and you start wanting different things um, and, you know, and you're looking down the road 10, 15 years and trying to picture yourself, where am I going to be at? You know, um, sometimes your priorities change a little bit. I mean, sure. if you had asked me, would I ever leave New York while I was living there? I would, probably would have said, no way, man. Like New York, you know, I'm a New Yorker, you know, I'm tough, man. Yeah. But eventually, you know, another opportunity comes up and you go, okay, this is kind of cool. And this is at a good time. And so, you know, Vegas, here we come. And that was when I moved to Vegas and it was like, wow, sunshine, like 320 days of the year. I and, do like the sunshine. I, I'm not yeah. crazy about the hundred degrees at night well, in July. But yeah. <laughs> I mean, right. <laughs> I mean, it's but, intense. The heat is intense there. I do yeah. spend a lot of time there because my my gal, uh, Kara, her folk, her folks are uh, out in Anthem. Okay, you know. sure. Yep. 
you could see the city beautiful yeah yeah I mean, it's a different climate and there's i mean you know it's just different i mean you the sky is way bigger in the west and there's mountains and yeah you know snow top mountains and stuff and i mean the highways are you know huge and you know really nice because there's not any potholes because they don't have any winters out there yeah. You know, it's just a whole different thing out there. You know, what was what the, was the gig that brought you there? Well, it, it wasn't really. I mean, it was sort of a gig. It started out. <laughs> it was a Christmas show that was with that same singer that I was doing those ship contracts with, and he had he was living there at the time, and he knew he was friends with Clint Holmes. All right. So Clint Holmes was doing a holiday show at the Sahara, and they got me in on the gig and. That was my first, like, literally, like a couple days after moving there, I was in a show room at the Sahara, playing with Clint Holmes. So you did the, you're one of the many drummers that have done Clint's gig. Oh uh, yeah, I guess you could say that technically. I mean, I wasn't part of his his run of shows where he was. I think he was at the Flamingo. I don't know. Maybe he was. He he might have jumped around. He had a band like a show that was like five, six, seven nights a week. I don't know how like how often it was. So he had his guys that he would always call upon, you know, horn section, everything. Um, this this was after that had ended for him. And so he was at the time, he was just kind of contracting shorter runs. So, um, yeah. So because I just had breakfast with our pal Larry Aberman. Do you know Larry? He did Zumanity for 18 yeah. years, right? Yeah, so I yeah. saw the first night of Zumanity opening night. Wow. Okay. It was crazy. It was crazy back in the day. And we kept in touch over the years. Fantastic player. Of course, he lives here now. Um, yeah. 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 Um, we knew each other a little bit in Vegas. Um, I went to his senior recital uh, when he was finishing his, I think it was his graduate degree. He, he got a- At a UNLV. Yeah. Yeah. And so I knew he was playing and he's a great player. And I did see him play the show also, the Zumanity show. Although you wouldn't really see him because he was hidden away the whole yeah. entire show. A lot of styles. A lot of styles. Yeah, that was wild. Um, and he did that show for a long time. And so, yeah, he's here now. And, w w you know, we since had coffee, I don't know, a couple yeah. months ago and hooked up. And he's been throwing me work even. like That's perfect. Been, well, yeah, there's, he's, he's but so he's that kind of, Larry's the guy like yourself. It's like you're cut from the same cloth. And I consider myself the same way, but no one would know it because everyone just says, oh, he's the bash rock guy. Cause we were on tour together. It's easy to see like, that's what he does. Right. But I mean, you guys can cover just about anything and you, and you read and you got a great musical mind. So yeah. I could see how you would throw each other work would be amazing. Yeah. 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 I kind of, it kind of fits. I think so. I yeah. mean, it's about being versatile and authentic in whatever style that you're, you know, uh, trying to perform. So yeah um yeah um larry's great and i have so much respect for him i mean he he came to town and it was just like he just got thrown right into the scene he got busy yeah. fast yeah. yeah yeah and there's no wonder why i mean he's, yeah. he's you know he yeah. can cover it well you too and we were you know we were doing the uh the tracy lawrence thing together and i uh we had a good what 20 something 30 shows together well i i got i don't know if it was that much or maybe I mean, it, was, it was maybe it was 20 15 to 20 shows maybe probably less than that even maybe 10 maybe shows it felt like that <laughs> did, did we do did we do the um what is the venue in the northeast like eight, i want to say like eight shows i, I think. did we do guilford together in new hampshire where they yeah, have that was, two that nights? Was where we got to hang because we did two nights yes and they've got the they got a cigar bar they got a whiskey bar they got oh the man the whole backstage fire pits that was, that's impressive back there yeah the best um, hospitality best yeah, totally totally and you know, and you and I were having fun because we were sitting on e in on each other's kits too. Yeah, I remember I got pictures of me playing your kit, and uh, and I have a I have some pictures and video of you playing my kit too. Yeah, a lot of fun. So yeah, and yeah, obviously man. you know our setups are just completely different from each other. So we were both kind of like, how the hell do you play this thing? Oh, everybody, everybody that sits down behind, what is going on with the snare drum? I'm like, I don't know, man. I just set it up that way the first time, and I never changed it. That was forty something years ago. <laughs> right. uh, so tell us about the cr traditional grip. I know you wanted to, to, to talk about that. You know, I started playing drums in '76, and my teacher was a rock drummer who played match grip. So literally, I never learned to play traditional grip i think it's so yeah. cool especially when you're playing you know bump 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 and you got the cigarette <laughs> hanging out of your mouth and it's just got a thing to it right you know? on. Sure, sure. yeah yeah right. man. <laughs> yeah 
I mean, you know, to be honest, I grew up playing match grip also, um, all the way up into my senior year of high school. And I had this great band director, uh, Peter Drew, if you're listening, you know, and um, what's up, he, Peter? Yeah, he he brought he would bring in guest artists from time to time. So uh, I remember he brought in Bob Mincer once and, yeah. you know, I uh, got to play with him. But one one time he brought in this guy named Jim Peterzak. Now I don't even know that name, but Jim used to teach at SUNY. Uh, that was SUNY Sutter's. School. That was Sutter's teacher. Yep. It was the northern one. What is it? Uh, not Purchase. Um, um, Hot Stand. Yep. Yeah. And so he came down and did like a master class with the jazz ensemble, and then I stayed late and had a little drum lesson with him. Well, he's a trad grip player. And turns out, I think he taught Dave Weckl in his early years. Ooh. And so, yeah, there's this lineage of like, you know, his, some of his students. And so I had no interest in learning traditional grip whatsoever at the time. But he just insisted on showing it to me, he showed me the grip, he showed me how it worked. And I was kind of like, you know, I'm a senior in high school, like I'm ready to go to music school. I'm like, I'm not going to start over with a new grip. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. You're killing me here, you know? But funny enough, you know, as as the weeks after that lesson went by, I started just sort of messing around with it at home and like on my lessons, just doing my snare drum etudes and stuff. And I start, it's I just noticed that it felt different, like something about it. The stick balance is different, something it's like. And then I started to, well, let's try this on the drum set and see if that feels you know and i mean i remember feeling really awkward at first and really like man my left hand is like a piece of meat right now you know mm -hmm. and i i still can picture myself trying to hit the the left side crash cymbal with my left hand and having to like I, I remember like being like what do i do with my elbow like oh okay so if i yeah if i bring my elbow up like this it's easier or if i if i put this maybe if i put the cymbal higher well that works too okay you know or like hitting the I hit the symbol my elbow comes down like this oh okay you know all these little things that you start figuring out and it just started me on a journey with that and i'll say this simultaneously you know i'm like i said ready to go to music school i was at the time just checking out all the great jazz and fusion drummers of the time so yes dave weckl vinnie Caliuta, steve gad chambers uh, yeah, Dennis Chan, like all the all the guys, you know, and, and going back further a lot, you know, into the sort of straight ahead jazz world, you know, Tony Williams, Jack, Jack DeJanet, Max Roach, Elvin Jones, all trad grip, grip players. Yeah. So I'm like, OK, there's something here that I want to copy and become that. Yeah. And so I just stuck with it. And before you knew it, I just started playing like that probably 90% of the time. It's great that you stuck with it because sometimes when we're presented in a situation like this is incredibly awkward. Like me working on my acoustic guitar chops would be like, my bat fingers, this isn't happening. I'm, I, my right hand, I, yeah, like, like my, my right hand is great because I can go dang, jiggy, jang, jiggy, but the long. left hand is right. just the horrible. left hand, I'm like, yeah, I know, same. I'm like all cramping up and yeah, same. Totally, but it's cool. Now, did you did you know a guy in Vegas? Um, he was in. We were in school together. We were in the two o'clock lab band together at UNT. He played with the Frankie Valley Show, or it was no. He played with was it Mama Me or what's the Frankie Valley Show where the drummers on stage? Jersey Boys. Jersey Boys. So Don Mioli. I know him very well. Yeah. So Don and I were in college together, and I forget what they used to call him. He he had a he had a great nickname, but Don he switched in college. To traditional grip i'm like you are brave dude you have to rebuild everything and it ended up working out great you know he ended yeah. up sounding sounding great with it but i was like i don't think i can do that. i don't think i can keep up with everything i'm responsible for and yeah. go back to square one well i'll say this i mean it's been a long journey with the trad grip i mean there are times periods of my life where i developed some pain and some problems and really had to sort of take a few steps back and and re-examine everything and my setup changed um there was a, a dv like a double dvd that steve smith came out with i was would have been like early 2000s 
and he talked about the grip and like the motion and stuff and it really kind of showed me i was like oh there was a few like key ingredients that i had missed along the way i mean the the, the main thing that was the hardest develop to to develop was the power right this to getting the same power as the match grip mm -hmm. it was the hardest thing to develop and having the endurance and the you know did you ever get one of those giant Keith Carlock goiters in there in the in the corner? Like, oh, wow, you could name I mean, it. To this day, I yeah, I mean, it's, you know, especially if I play like a lot of hours, you know, um, yeah, a little bit. I have a, a good little you know callus in there. He he, I mean, back in the day when we were kind of in Dallas, kind of coming up, he was playing a group called Dallas Brass and Electric. He was just swapping backbeats all. He had this giant thing. I bet. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. And I've 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 watched his grip too, and I don't know how he does what he does because he does it different than I do. He holds the stick back further, and my I oh, use much more of a molar kind of a stroke, where yeah. it's you know the power is coming from the shoulder and the the upper arm. Yeah, me yeah, too. Yeah, and you're just whipping it down. I don't see him doing that as much. He's much more like just straight up and down, and he's using the thumb and very open handed. Like I don't. I don't know how he does it. Also, I mean, it, what's what's it's heartbreaking when I would watch this happen and be like, "How does he do that? I can't do that. It's never going to work for me." Whenever he plays a backbeat, he plays four notes. He would play, right? I mean, I'm like, "Oh my god!" Right. The pocket and the power, and then be these yeah. four other notes. Ghosted notes. I know. I know. Well, and that's the beauty of the trad grip is that the hand is under the stick, so it's a lot easier to bounce the stick. Really, it's just you just kind of let it go, and it does what it's going to do. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas with the match grip, your hand is over the stick, and now you sort of have to almost manipulate it to get four bounces like that. You know, mm -hmm. it's a it's a different technique, but yeah, one is not better than the other. They're just different, and I still will switch back to match grip for certain things. If I if I want to get into a character like I don't know John Bonham or you know Keith Moon or something, and just think of players like that, bring their essence out. Yeah. Yeah, you know, then I'll try. Then I'll I will switch to match grip. I'll stick. You know, use the butt end of the stick and just you know ACDC you know style. Yeah. You know, Phil yeah. Rudd. So who? So who would have been your your whole your holy grails? Your Mount Rushmores of drumming heroes? Is it with the typical guys, or are there some guys that we were like, ooh, that's interesting. That's pretty unique. Well, I always gravitated and still do to the clean players, the studio guys. So. Gad was my first, like, oh my God, this guy is the best. Like, and Gad, we trust. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Now, have you met no. Steve? Steve Gad? No, I've never, no. I've seen him play twice with James Taylor. I've never seen him up close, even playing. You know, I've, it's always been, in, you know, at the arenas and stuff. The but... internal clock. Oh, he's incredible. He's just to this day. I mean, you know how one of a kind. He? He's 80. My gosh, he's just killing it out there, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, he was the first one that I really got into. And and I, you know, I had lesson lessons with different instructors along the way who showed me some of the stuff that he was like the six stroke roll and the stuff that he was into with the Radam accuse and that li -boom, li -boom, crazy li -boom. army, yep. you know, that solo that he would always play. Um Did you pick up the yeah. Gadamitz book? I have it. Yeah. It's yeah. it's amazing. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's kicking my butt that thing. I need to work more out of it because That's going to be my my backstage warm up this year, I yeah, think. That's those flam tap. Just go slow. Like you don't even need to play it fast. Like just go slow and it's like, "Oh my word." I started like seeing stuff come out of my playing just like, "Whoa, I didn't even mean for that to happen." You know. <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. But yeah, no, like I always gravitated towards the clean players like John J. R. Robinson, um I mean, you know, obviously Jeff Bacaro, mm -hmm. um, you know, Weckle, Vinny, you know, all those main guys, all those like guys that are just super articulate. Um, I love Phil Collins growing up. You know, I'm a I'm a child of the 80s. So anything with Phil, Col I could instantly recognize Phil Collins playing. Like, how does he do that? Like, how how does he play a backbeat groove like nobody else can? I, I just don't know. What's that? You know. What's that song from Genesis or his solo career? I forget, but it's there's a horn section, and there's a hand clap on beat three. That's, um, that is a Genesis song. 
It's, yeah, what is the name of that? No, thing? no, 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 no reply at all. Yeah. No reply at all. With the horn section. Fantastic. Man, I have studied that track and still do. I mean, that's a good one. Try to make it feel like that is, oh my gosh. Yes. So definitely the clean players, me as well, because I had a studio mentality. I was like, how can I get in that room with all those microphones and create something that will last forever that people will hear in elevators and supermarkets? Okay, you got to learn how to play clean. But also, yeah. in, interestingly, in yeah. another way, equally beautiful is I wouldn't consider Keith Moon clean at all, but it is so perfect. Yeah. In a way, it's very precise. Uh, yeah, just right. like Zigaboo is Oh, not yeah. right. Clean, but is perfect. Richie Hayward was not, but perfect. But yeah, agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Even Ringo. I mean, yeah, yes. agreed. Charlie Watts. You know, sure. I mean, yes. Those those players that you mentioned have that swagger. You know, but but you wouldn't put Charlie Watts in on a click track with like a studio band. You know, I don't think anyway. No, nope. you know? I mean. I don't think that ever happened, you know. I don't know. I mean, but then he can go do Ronnie Scott's with his band and play Spang Spang Line. Right. Well, and that's what he would. Right. I mean, that was yeah. his bag, really. That was what he really wanted to do. Crazy. <laughs> From what I know. Of, yeah. Of the, now, right. what about what? What's your jazz holy grail, uh, Mount Rushmore? Oh gosh. I mean, you know. When I was young, I mean, I was just being fed from my my. I come from a musical family, so. My father, my uncles, my grandfather, you know, multiple generations. So all of my family members and friends of theirs were feeding me all sorts of records to check out. James Brown, Tower of Power, Earth, Wind & Fire, Sly and the Family Stone, Blood, Sweat & Tears, um, uh, Shaw Day, uh, early Whitney Houston, you know, all the like the you know, Luther Vandross, anything jazz, R&B, soul, Aretha Franklin, um, yeah. gosh, Anna, King Curtis. I got my Aretha shirt on, baby. Bam, there you go. Yeah, nice. I love it. <laughs> so, you know, I, I grew up on all of that stuff, and um, I forget the question now, but... Oh, yeah, who is your <laughs> jazz oh, um, yeah. Mount Rushmore? So, so, you know, I was just more and more getting into jazz, especially my one uncle... Uh, who went to Eastman as a piano player and you know he he makes his living as a as a pianist uh, wow so he would he would come home from LA and have this pile of CDs like for me to check out and it would be a lot of it would be a lot of pretty hardcore you know straight ahead jazz stuff um that you know at the time I would never have heard of you know a lot of old herbie stuff old miles records um gosh all sorts of stuff I mean you know, stuff with Elvin Jones on it, uh, Art Blakey, I mean, just on and on and on, you know. So that was how I started getting into and just kind of, it was sort of bending my ear in that direction to to start hearing straight ahead jazz and um, just getting used to that sound, you know, which was a different, completely different style of playing, obviously. Um, and then you know, you go to you go to music school and you want to get in the the jazz ensemble and the big band and you want to you know and you're playing with your, your friends and you're playing in combos and booking gigs at the local cafes and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, all the and, stuff, all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, you're just learning tunes and you know playing stuff out of the real book and um you know, you're just you're just learning, learning, learning all the while and and um eventually I heard Bill Stewart the drummer Bill Stewart played. Yeah, that's great, baby. On a, on a Bill Sharlap record, and it was, it, it was just a moment of like, oh my, that's how I want to sound. Like again, super clean. Like his jazz playing is some of the cleanest, you know, and yeah. the way he executes his ideas, and he's so musical in his phrasing, and the way he'll he'll take a motif and he'll like expand it and turn it upside down and play it backwards and invert it. And Oh my, I just, I, I just connected with his playing on such a level. And then just, on, you know, just the sound of his drums, so clean and crisp, the, the sound of his ride cymbal and like the, the feel that he got on his ride yeah. cymbal 
when you know he'd be playing ride and not even playing the hi hat in two and four. It's just the ride, dang, 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 dang. You know, he was just very open, very modern and contemporary. I just fell in love with Bill Stewart, and I I just had to learn how to play like him, and I I went down the rabbit hole with him. Oh, yeah, and I, I like how you own the fact that you're just like, look at, I'm an all around musician, I'm an all around drummer. I'm also, I'm a jazz drummer. Like you will just, you know, when I moved here in 97, the Tommy Wells, God rest his soul. He said, yeah. don't say the word jazz in this town. Yeah. I've had conversations with other musicians in Nashville about that. One quite recently, actually. I like how you just own it. And you're like, look at, I, I do this and I do that. Well, and I think that if you do things authentically, that it won't count against you, you know? Maybe some people from the outside looking in don't agree or don't just don't know, or they, maybe they just kind of, you know, write you off. Hopefully not. No. Yeah. I hope, I hope not, you know, but like it or not, it's part of who I am as a musician and I love that music and I don't want it to die. And I think there's a healthy jazz community here in Nashville. I mean, I sh I'll say this when I, when I decided to move to Nashville, I didn't think I'd ever play another jazz gig again. I mean, you know? I, I let some of it atrophy a little bit. I think that the, the culture of having a Rudy's jazz room has really helped the oh, scene. Absolutely. That is a gold mine of a place. Please, if you if you come to Nashville, go to Rudy's jazz room. And you got to go to Rudy's. And then the other place I say to everyone is you got to go to Robert's Western World because they oh, play yeah. the 1950s country, the with, country. The, with the pearl yeah. snaps and the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. I, I agree on both levels. Yeah. I'm, it, it, you know, um, well, you know, little did I know in Nashville, there's a healthy jazz scene, you there know, is, but yeah. I did not expect that when I moved here. And I, I mean, I moved here sight unseen. I mean, I just came here and I was like, I'm moving to Nashville. I've never been there. I don't know anybody there hardly at all. I'm just going to go there because somebody told me that I would do well there. Was that uh, Kirsty Manna and Bill Warner? It was, yes, yeah. yeah. Now, now, Bill. Now, for those that aren't in the know, like Kirsty's a award-winning songwriter, and her husband Bill. I've been done a million sessions for Bill, probably until he met you. Um, but he was like, "Hey, you gotta, you gotta, you got to check this kid out. He's doing a great job with this tribute show we're doing. I keep telling him to move to town, and I'm glad you did it, man." Yeah, yeah, it was a big step, you know. And I mean, because I was pretty well established in Vegas, and. You know, but I just wasn't happy there anymore. And, you know, and it made sense for my family as well. My son was born at that point. He was pretty much ready to go to, to kindergarten. Yeah. And the schools in Vegas, I, I don't think that's much what Larry was saying. Larry is saying they're a little rough. Yeah. So, you know, that was a big part of it as well. So it just made sense for all three of us, really, my wife and my son and I. Yeah. Um, for me, you know, career wise, I had sort of hit the glass ceiling. I had already had my own show for a year. I was subbing in on any number of shows on any given week up and down the strip. I had my own jazz trio. I had my own rock band that was like a cover band. We were playing the lounges. I was doing tribute shows. I was I was just all over. I mean, I was my head was spinning. I mean, I had three kits at any property at any, you know, I remember one. That's a, that's a bona fide business. You were a small business owner, entrepreneur, and it was, was working. But man, man, yes, I was burning out. Is what was really happening. Yeah, that can happen because because I found there to be a lot of sort of mediocrity in the musicianship uh, there in Vegas. It, it, there's a lot of like attitude about like just do the bare minimum so that we don't get fired, kind of a yeah. thing. Yeah. And I don't like that. Music is more to me than that. I have to, I have to, it has to be special for me. And so, you know, it was really kind of rubbing me the wrong way in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, you know, again, looking down the, the line 10, 15 years, I'm like, what's, what else is here for me? Where else, where am I going to be in 10 years? Probably going to be doing the same thing I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. And I want more than that. Yeah, that's that was my Dallas, yeah, quandary. I was like, I think I hit go the to ceiling. A industry, you have yeah. to go where there's more stuff happening, where there's a bigger pond with bigger fish swimming in that pond. Yeah, man. Yeah, and so and that's how you keep learning too. I mean, oh my gosh, the, the leaps and bounds that I've grown since you know I moved here. Oh my gosh, you know, just just learning the Nashville number system, 
which is I did that like the first week I moved to Nashville, knowing full well that this is going to happen one day. I'm going to be, you know, I'll be on a session and somebody's going to hand me a chart and I'm going to be like, what the heck's this? You know, I didn't want that. Yeah, it's glad you checked it out in advance. I did not. I learned on the floor. So scary. Oh my gosh. I would have been pooping my pants. I mean, yeah. But, you know, I learned it and, you know, I realized, I mean, I said to myself, like, where has this been my whole life? I've, I could have used this in all the years that I've been playing in my career. Why don't they teach this in the music schools? You That's know, what Jim Morelli says. Song charting made easy. He's like, everybody in the world should be using this system. They, they should be teaching this at every music school, at least at least in the drum set world and in the you know rhythm section world. Um, because I remember looking at, you know, making old charts and it's like, you know, count 16 bars and who wants to count 16 bars on a gig? I don't, you know, makes yeah. no sense to me. You're not thinking in a musical way when you're counting to 16, you know? Yeah, because like, well, the, you know, I do I do like drum phrase charts in the sense that if they're detailed enough, because most likely if it's a 16 bar phrase, you're going to have to break it up into eight and eight because maybe the kick drum pattern will change or maybe something, a voice well, will change. Well, if you're reading a transcription, that's yeah. one thing, you yeah. know? I'm just talking about like sketch, you know, skeleton charts where you're just like, you don't even know the song and you're like, well, I know the bridge is eight bars. Okay. You know, that kind yeah. of thing where you're just kind of like throwing music together for some, you know, show that you're playing tomorrow night, you know, and there's 45 songs to learn, you know? Yeah. Um, with the number system, it's just, it just w makes way more sense. And I just remember thinking like, wow, this really would have been helpful to know like, all those years ago yeah so i love and, it and it is yeah. it is incredibly efficient and it does make what we do in nashville it helps that efficiency because you know we are cranking out songs yeah yeah you know yeah that's right and i mean just you know in the in the different bands and ensembles that i'm playing with right now i mean i still i'm writing i wrote a chart last night you know yeah number chart no, always writing a chart. Hey, tell us about the Mannheim steamroller thing because sure. is it? I think that you do that seasonally. That's your um, yeah. Trans Siberian, right? But mm -hmm. um, a little bit about the history of Mannheim. I think it's Chip Davis, right? Chip Davis is yeah. he still alive? He is, and he's, he's got um, multiple versions of the band, right? Well, there's okay, yes. So there's so traditionally there are two bands that go out a red band and a green band and they go out simultaneously to tour one takes the east coast sort of east of the mississippi and the other one goes on the west coast and kind of hits the rockies and whatnot um and they swap every few years so you're gonna nice. you know depending on what your 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 itinerary changes but um and then in addition to those two bands there is another production where they play, I think it, last year they played two weekends in Orlando at Disney um, with like a symphonic whole symph symphony. I don't know how many piece, maybe 60 nice. pieces or so, but, and he conducts that. Nice. Um, his, you know, he doesn't go out on the road anymore, uh, but he's the creator of the entire thing. He, he wrote all the arrangements or at least co-wrote the arrangements and, um, yeah, he's he's done real well with that, and it's been a huge success for him. Um, the most the most famous song being "Carol the Bells." Probably, I guess right? so. Yeah, and it's a big drum feature. Yeah, jingle gang gong, gang go gang gong. Yeah, that's the big closing number uh, in the show. Um, a lot of fun to play. Um, so, what's so, the group consist of? Is it like a contemporary ensemble, bass, drums, yeah, guitar, I mean, so there's keys, a core band? Uh, the drum set chair, it's mainly drum set, but I'm also playing multiple other percussion instruments. I play a lot of glockenspiel, so orchestra bells, um, toy piano. Wow. Um, various other percussion, like triangle and suspended cymbal, stuff like that. Um, there's a hammered dulcimer part that I play. Beautiful, man. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty wild. It's pretty all over the place. And just depending on which tunes that they put in the set list, it they you know that will change from year to year. Um, and so that so that's my chair. And then next to me, there is a percussionist who plays timpani and all sorts of bell parts and mallet parts, uh, hand drums and shakers and doodads, tambourines. 
And she also plays recorder. So all the recorder parts are played wow. by Roxanne there right next to me to my right. Um, the band is a six piece band. There's a pianist, like a, a piano one, and he's playing a real piano. And the other uh, keyboard player, he's on the stage right, and he plays the harpsichord and various other synth patches. And then there is a violinist in the band, and she's the concert master. And then in addition to her, there's one more is the the bass player, but he also kind of switches on and off between bass and guitar and lutes and different different stringed instruments. It's wow. a yeah, it's a really sort of eclectic, uh, pretty unique musical situation for all of us for all the different chairs. And what's um, the um... so in addition to that, they they contract uh, locally gotcha. the orchestra, so they have a string section and plus an oboe player on stage right and then on my side stage left there's two brass players a trumpet and a french horn so nice that idea. kind of rounds out the whole band that's great and then how do you guys what is your schedule like in the holiday months and how do you guys travel is it bus or flights it's bus uh you know they're based in omaha so oh. we'll we'll fly to omaha for a couple of days do rehearsals in their facility there and then we'll fly out to wherever the tour starts and then join the bus. And then you're on the bus for the next two months because it's about yeah, it's about a seven week tour. And it's it's a grueling schedule. I mean, we were playing, you know, seven, eight shows a week kind of thing. There's, Do you miss Thanksgiving and Christmas? Well, you yeah, you're away from home for those. Yeah. Now we had we had Thanksgiving and Christmas Day off. And I think we had Christmas Eve off too. So um yeah, you're you know, that's that can be challenging with a family, especially uh, last year. It wasn't so bad because we were in Huntsville for Christmas. So family just drove down and we stayed in the hotel together. Nice. Um, But yeah, we you know, Thanksgiving, we have a big you know, they throw us a big dinner and it's all, you know, all the production people. And the, that's know. the least they can do. OK, well, that's cool. Yeah. And then and then now with that same kind of skill set, the reading and the stylistic interpretation, you're doing some stuff with the National Symphony, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, got kind of hooked up with the pops conductor of the National Symphony, Enrico Lopez Yanez. I hope I'm saying that right. Yeah. Um, he's wonderful. And um Ever since meeting him, we we had a nice conversation just about different, you know, gigs that I was doing and my background and stuff. And, you know, Monday came around and I had an email from the symphony about, hey, do you want to play this show? And I was like, wow, that easy, huh? That's incredible. <laughs> you know? Well, it, it is. And I, I'm so grateful for that work. I mean, it is so incredible to to play at the Schirmerhorn and with the whole Nashville symphony and to just great be part acoustics of, yeah yeah the acoustics and just be part of like the the ensemble i mean it's just hearing the the uh, you know the orchestra i'm right on stage with them and you yeah. know playing these great pieces and meeting everyone in the orchestra and you know uh meeting the percussion section sam Baco is back there he's the yeah i love sam yeah is scott yeah. that's uh what's his name scott Yes. 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 Tall's... I don't know. I forget his last name. What the yes. hell? We're both playing. We both got to take our Ginkgo Balboa. I know. I know. Um, Scott. He's, uh, yeah. He's been Scott in Corey. He's not there every time, but what is it? Scott Corey. Yeah. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Hello. Yep. Sorry, Scott. I haven't seen you in a while, buddy. Yep. But they're going back yep. to like the 90s. I met all these guys, you know? Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 So it's such a good time. I mean, I bring my kid in there and I get to choose like which drum kit I want to use for the show. And, you know they have all these nice mics that they're using on the kid and it, oh man it's i love just geeking out with everybody in there it's it's just a great time i i've played a whole I, I don't know how many productions i've played with them now they're all different each one is different um sometimes there's a huge percussion section i mean i played this this one show that was commissioned uh gosh i'm trying to remember the name of it now uh shoot but there was all these like haitian drummers and all this like Latin rhythms and it was combined with like a sort of a jazz show that I was playing like some swing stuff in the show. Like, Oh man, it was, it was wild. It was What's so the schedule cool. when you do a, a production with the symphony? It's, I mean, it just depends on what, 
what the what they need. I mean, I've done you know shows where it's just like rehearsal in the afternoon, show at night. That's it. You're done. Or else I've done other shows where it's like a whole series of rehearsals and then you know a series of shows after that. Um, it's you know they're never they never run too long. You know usually. It, a show will last like three performances or so, like a Friday, uh, Saturday, Sunday kind of thing. Um, hey, does yeah. that go into your um, AFM pension? Yeah, S that's all union. Yeah. Isn't that beautiful that Symphon, because I talked to Neil Grover, and I was telling okay. Neil Grover about my pension because our, my pension is based on um, recording sessions that I do that get right. airplay. Card. Right. His pension was based on every live performance he did with the Boston Symphony for 40 years. There you go. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's That's where being a symphonic musician really pays off. Oh, yeah. I mean, those guys who are in the orchestra, if you're the principal timpanist or, you know, I mean, yeah, you're working. You're making money and you're doing well. You yeah. Good, I, I imagine. Return. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I don't know what the numbers are, but I mean, I could only imagine, you know. Yeah. And it's, you know, I mean, they have, they're seasonal. It's not like they're, they're not playing all year long. You know, they, they have their on season and they have an off season. I think they're off during the most of the summer and then they go back on in the fall again and then through Christmas. So, um, but yeah, uh, what a great gig, you know, if you can land a gig like that, you know, I mean, I, for me, I'm just contracted as a sideman with them. So when they, when they need a drum set player who, you know, they can count on for time or playing styles or whatever and read the part and stuff. Then they call me and, and I know I'm not the only one either. There's other guys that they call in town too. So it's not like I'm well, God rest his soul. Bob Mater was one of them. I believe um, he was a styles guy. Um, I don't know how long the list is, but I'm going to try to get on that thing way down the list. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to get on that list. That sounds sexy. Cause what I, what I'm, getting from our conversation is that there is a lot of underbelly opportunities that one wouldn't normally think of that you're in the mix with. There is a lot of work out there. These corporate parties, the jazz brunches, the symphony, these tribute well, shows, you've got your own band. Yeah. yeah. You have to be versatile. I mean, a gig like playing with the symphony, it's like, you got to follow the conductor, man. Like you got to play soft. You know, when they ask you to play soft and oh, I yeah. mean soft, <laughs> you know, you think you're playing soft. No, play like way softer. You have to judge it based on the dirty looks you're getting from the violin section. Oh, that's always I mean, forget. It. I mean, like, yeah, they're they hate. That. I think they the hate looks, even you, you're not even set up yet and you're getting the dirty looks like I'm yeah. like, oh, thanks a lot. Yeah. yeah. No, I try to win them over. You know, I try to be, you know, be super friendly with them and and. You know, and yeah. hopefully my playing wins them over by the end of the show or whatever, because I want them to like me. You know, it's like I'm I'm trying to be a musical drummer, you know, is play music on these drums. You know, yeah, why, I why not have chocolate? Know? They'll pass out little chocolate. That's what my grandfather would do. He would have had little, these little right. he always had these little Jordan almonds in his coat somewhere. Yeah. And he would trickle Smart. these, you know, I need to do that. <laughs> Jordan <laughs> almonds. Let's bring them back. I don't even know if they make them anymore. Um, I wouldn't know. Candy coated almonds. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. I, I think it's great. And then as far as your home tracking, are you on air gigs and soundbetter.com to get the I'm work? On or? Both of those. Yeah. I, you know, years ago I was getting some traction on air gigs and then it sort of, I guess maybe COVID just kill it. I don't know. Just it tapered off one day, one day and it never came back and sound better. I got on there. I don't know, maybe like two years ago. I forget what it was, but Man, I haven't had one. It's been like like a ghost town for me. <laughs> um, I, I'm trying to figure out like how how do I break through the noise on those sites? I don't know. I, I just don't like that you have to put your pricing on there because a lot of times yeah, people I don't are like that. Yeah, like I'm shopping for a great drummer for under a hundred dollars a song. You know what I mean? It's, it's like, a race eh. to the bottom in a yeah. lot of ways. Yeah. You know, and I don't. I mean, yeah, I'm not charging a hundred dollars. I'm charging more than that. Yes, <laughs> you as know? you should, as you should. Yeah. The, 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 and this is what I tell teachers and people that are doing home recording sessions. You have an advanced degree. You've been playing drums since the seventies, eighties. Well, professionally since like when did you start? Ninety-ish, like yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. So we're talking decades here. Yeah, I don't want to 
anger any masseuses that are listening right now. We all need you. We love you. We understand that you understand how the human body works and trigger points and different. Are we doing Swedish? Are we doing athletic? What do we? I get it, but I don't know how long you go to school. Six months, maybe a year. Yeah. You make eight. They make eighty dollars an hour. It's a dollar a minute plus usually a twenty dollar tip. Yeah. So then why are drummers charging $25 an hour for a drum lesson or $100 a track? No, you're way off and you're bringing the whole thing way down. Yes, the bar is going way too low. You have to charge at least a dollar a minute for your skill set that is highly developed. You, you invested in yourself. You paid for higher education, your gear bill, all the practice, oh, all the sacrificing. Come on. And just, you know, I'm here, I'm engineering everything myself, you know, mm -hmm. it's not, you know, I mean, you have two to jobs. learn so much. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a job, man. And I mean, it's a fun job. Don't give me, you know, I wouldn't do it if it wasn't fun, you know, oh, yeah. there's harder ways to make money. Easy. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> right. But, but there's a huge skill set involved and yeah, it's, yeah. People need to stop chasing each other to the bottom of the, of the, you know the scale there yeah yeah mm -hmm. so hopefully so, i don't know let's yeah let's spread the word charge what you charge and proudly own it because you know you know that deep down in your soul you're worth that amount yeah oh mm -hmm. yeah oh yeah you know when you work as hard as as you and i have and you develop these skills not not only drum set wise but you know the miking and the you know and then all the post stuff i mean you know all the file management. Well, you're a brave man. I bring in my drum tech and we do it together and I got to stroke him some money. So I lose a bit of some profit, but the workflow. Right. I've thought about doing that. The but joy yeah. in the award, the workflow is more pleasant because yeah. I don't have to deal with the file management. Right. And, you know, and there are some clients that I work with who want me to actually like mix the drums or the song or the record. And it's like, you know, geez man like i'm not a, you know i didn't go to school for that you know i'm just self-taught i yeah i watch a lot of youtube <laughs> you know that's when i would say ah you got this i'm sending you the raw performance you know i mean but, yeah, yeah you know it's it can be challenging and i've had to learn that the hard way i've had to learn to ask that because you know i would send files in that you know, that were raw unmixed and then the, the song would come out and i'd be like why do the drums sound raw like you just you didn't you didn't mix anything you didn't you got, you know. hello yeah yeah and so you learn the hard way that and and then you yeah. go okay so you want me to mix this then you know i'll probably charge you a little bit more to do that um which is valid yeah yeah totally so, valid you know but but i find i find enjoyment in it because i get better and better at it as each time i do it you know and you find new ways to to mix and to you totally. know, solve problems and whatnot. Yeah. I love it. I love it. I mean, at the end of the day, we're making a difference in people's lives. We're helping bring their art to life. It's, it's a really, it's a grand calling. It really is. And Oh, it's great. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I've always just wanted to be a session guy. Like, you know, I mean, I love playing live, but be careful what you wish for. Cause you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean it, Sometimes, yeah, I've talked to guys in town who are like known as session guys, and sometimes they they're kind of dark sometimes, and they well, say things like, "I don't actually listen to the music that I record and stuff," and it makes me wonder, like, really? Yeah, like, hmm. Well, you know, strange. Johnny Depp says he's never watched a daily event or has seen any of his films, which I cannot even. How would you not just by accident see Sleepy Hollow or Pirates of the Caribbean? Yeah, Come on, right. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, I'm just trying to cobble a living together. You know? And you're doing it, man. You're doing it. You're, you know, you're in, you know, beautiful Tennessee here. You got a, a studio in your house. You got the, you know, bed people downstairs. You know, I mean, you're doing the thing, man. So now you're a veteran of three major music cities. You've received a lot of advice. Now that you're an eight year veteran of Nashville, somebody's moving to Nashville. What would you tell them? Well, if they're, I mean, if they're just getting started with their career, if they're young, you know, maybe right out of school or whatever, uh, just have a system for learning new music is a big one because you're just going to get thrown all these songs all at once and you're going to be expected to know it on stage. Yeah. And, you know, just be, 
as versatile as you can. Don't be like super, you know, like uh, myopic. Yeah, like listen to <laughs> listen to multiple styles and don't you know, if you're a country guy, don't just listen to country. Check out some R and B stuff. Check out pop or you know maybe a jazz record or, you know or like an acoustic record of some sort or you know just find other things to dig in on to sort of sponge into your playing yes um you know and again all always being authentic always having coming from an authenticity point of view because people can smell a fake a mile away even you know even you know other fake people yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know other listeners who aren't musicians you know they can smell a fake and so learn your styles you know learn you know if you're a guitar player learn your learn how to get tones and copy you know the tone that's from the record or whatever it is you know yeah. um i you know i'm a big fan of learning to read music because i it helps me it helps me on shows and and i don't have to memorize things i can just read it and I can play it like, like I memorized it. I'll exactly. fool everybody in that room, including the artist. I've played entire shows where they never knew you were reading, but the, you yeah, were. The, the artist never right. He was like, "Thanks for memorizing all my stuff," and I I read the whole darn thing. Yeah. I counted it off. I led the whole thing. Mm -hmm. and he never. I fooled him completely. Dude, I do the same thing. I will write that stuff out. Reading music is the, literally the cornerstone of my educational philosophy. To me, I consider it even more important than rudiments because if you can play a, a, a couple of great beats and you get a good sound on your instrument, what's yeah. going to propel your career is not yeah. the ability to do a five-stroke roll. Believe me, you're going to need it, but right. your ability to learn lots of material quickly. Yeah. Yeah, that's in Nashville. That's big time. The name of the game, and and I'll say this: like being comfortable with playing something that you don't know. Like you get calls to do on Broadway, and you get somebody requests a song, and you're the only guy in the band that doesn't know the song. Well, you better get used to that feeling because that's going to happen, and yeah. you better know how to fake it. Yeah, know? and hopefully the bass player like look at straight eighths, medium rock, four on the floor. Watch me for the stops. Know what to ask for. All that stuff. Right. How does it start? How does it end? Right. All that stuff. Yes, yeah. exactly. And Killer, man. That, that, that's a good skill set. I'm and just so other... happy you're here, man. And we just, you know, we I, we didn't get to spend enough time together. I was like, you know, on that tour together. But, uh, yeah, um, you know, I want to come see I, I Mount so Juliet. Watching you play, man. I, I just, I was really, you know, you are the ultimate, like, stadium rock drummer. I, lo I love oh, watching. Man. You're so entertaining to watch, to play, and to listen to, obviously. I mean, you've got such a killer groove, but, like, just visually... You're just a lot of fun to watch, and I I take oh, inspiration man. from that. Yeah. Oh, man. thank you. It means yeah. so much to me, man. And I, I'm just yeah. a big fan of it. Everybody, check out BrianZach.com, and that's C Z A C H.com. He's a member of the Polish American Club. You know, binka, 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 <laughs> bing. Uh, uh, I always tell everybody, hey, you got to learn your train beat, and you got to learn the two step, binka, binka, bing. Uh, but but no, there's a there's actually a video of you sight reading a Big Bang track, and it sounds incredibly good. Oh. Thanks, man. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, that's a skill I worked on long and hard, and, and you know, all through school and you know, and beyond. Even you know, on the cruise ships, and you'd get thrown these these shows and you know these charts that are sometimes they're a mess and sometimes they're immaculate. But like, yeah. you got to read that stuff. Like you own it. You know. Yeah, I worked on that really, really hard. I loved playing in the big band. It's equally as satisfying as playing in a kick-ass rock band. I because agree. A, a great big band that swings together, that moves as an organism and trusts Ooh. their drummer. Oh, it's a great it's thing. So fun. Yeah. You know, Ellington, really? Basie, and then you got yeah. into the, the modern, the Nestico stuff and the Mincer yeah. stuff and the, yeah. the Gordon Goodwin, Big Fat. Well, that's a band. Whoa. Oh, I know. I love it. I love all of that stuff. You yeah. know, and really, really great. Yeah. Hey, we're going to close out with the uh, fave five. What's your favorite color? Usually green. Green. I don't get a lot of greens, man. Yeah, I like I like purple too, but green. Yeah, Green and purple. What about your uh, favorite food, favorite dish? Oh, gosh. It's got to be Italian, probably. I love going to Italy. Yeah. It's probably like a, like a good carbonara. Very nice. Yeah. And yeah, will you now as far as a drink, would you pair that with a red? What would you do? What's your favorite oh, drink? Absolutely. Chianti Classico all the way. 
Yeah. Oh, like Italian table wine. Yeah, and I'm not Italian one bit, but I just love Italian food. I'm not Polish, but I love pierogies. Um, <laughs> and my ex-wife was Polish, and so we'd go up to Michigan and like eat the heck out of those pierogies. Yeah, you get fat yeah. eating that stuff. Well, same thing with the with the Italian too. Totally, <laughs> dude. Um, what is this? Is kind of a tough one, but what is your favorite song in the sense that this thing comes on the radio and you are going to crank that thing up, man? gotta be phil collins something phil collins probably probably in the air tonight why not right or maybe yeah or maybe like uh easy lover dude with philip bailey yeah what a drum sound what a drum oh. part yes <laughs> just crank it way up. massive <laughs> application of the six stroke roll yeah yeah man <laughs> i love it and then your favorite movie oh gosh Maybe um, Lost in Translation. Classic Coppola. Yeah. So awkward. Yes. I, There's the, the you know we're going coming full full circle now because we you know talking about going to Tokyo in Japan. Watch that film and and you see and I I remember watching that film after being in Tokyo and I was like that's how I felt. The way Bill Murray's walking around and just like yeah you know. <laughs> just like gawking, you know, it's just strange, strange. Kind thing, that that you know? May December romance is also kind of highlighted. Yeah. You know, yeah. and yeah. you just end up hating Rabisi's character. You're like, what is wrong with you? Your wife is awesome. I know. I know. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. What's the best way for people to get in touch? With you contact you through Brianzac.com? Yeah, probably. Or just on social, you know, at Brian Zach on Instagram or Facebook. I mean, I, you know, I'm on all the, I'm easy to find. Just yeah. search my name. Yep. That's what I say. I'm a sitting deck on the Google Nader, man. Um, yeah. Well, I'm going to come out and visit with you, man, in the Mount Juliet. Let's do it. Yeah. And uh, man, congratulations on your Nashville journey. You are just taking it by storm, man. Great. Great to have you on here. And hey, to all the listeners, thanks for tuning in. Be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. It helps everybody find the show. And until next time, hey, we're going to be here. We'll see you next time. Brian, thanks, man. Bye-bye. Take care. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.